Thanks, Paolo. Uh, and I should also thank organizers for in invitations uh, uh, to talk here. It's a great opportunity and also to visit this great place. It's really great to be here. Uh, so, uh, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is, uh, so let me give you a little bit of history of bootstrapping. Uh, so, as you know, uh, perhaps it started early 1960s by J Jeffrey Chu, uh, American physicist. Uh, so the idea, the mantra was that particles pull themselves up by their own bootstrap. So, uh, and they had some success. I mean, it was part of the S matrix program. They had some success. For example, they predicted uh, some particles that they were immediately observed. Uh, so this was shown of success of the program, but then the program failed. And uh, what also happened in between was that gauge theory was shown to be renormalizable and it became the mainstream for particle physics after that. Uh, but then the, there was a second life of uh, bootstrapping that started with work, work of uh, Polyakov, Belyavin, and Zabulochikov. So that was in uh, 1983, around that time, uh, in a great paper that set up the conformal field theory. They used bootstrap. And then uh, recently, meaning uh, 10, 15 years ago, Starting with that, so there was some uh, work of uh, Richkov and collaborators where they did, uh, uh, they extended actually the techniques of uh, Polyakov and collaborators uh, to three-dimensional conformal field theory. So they had great success. Um, now, so what I will, uh, my, my motivation was this paper of uh, Henry Lee, where he uh, did uh, start bootstrapping through uh, positivity constraints on some matrix integrals, which are not tractable using uh, standard techniques of random matrix theory, but nevertheless, uh, bootstrapping positivity constraints, as I explained, it turned out to be quite successful. Then in between, uh, so we wrote this paper in between Kazakov and Zhang, uh, he's a student, did uh, similar things, uh, related things, and then bootstrapping uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, or matrix quantum mechanics become, became popular and successful. Lattice gauge theory, uh, it was used there. So this is the third thing that my, my, will be my focus, but my, now let me also mention something very interesting also happened very recently that this bootstrapping ideas now is being used to compute actually with high precision, the eigenvalues of uh, Laplace operators on some uh, hyperbolic manifolds, Einstein manifolds, things like that. So uh, actually through these methods, uh, uh, one of the papers, these guys are able to, conf to give very, very strong evidence to Selberg's uh, one over four conjecture about the smallest positive eigenvalue of uh, Laplacians on, 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 on hyperbolic uh, manifolds. So, um, it's not a proof, but it's, it's, it's a very good evidence that still conjecture is true. I believe the bound they get is better than Sarnak bounds, but okay, I, I just have to check again, but that's a uh, lower bound. Okay, so, but now uh, uh, back to the uh, subject of the talk proper. Uh, well, as you know, I mean, in, in quantum uh, field theory, you one way to uh, compute the uh, expectation values of your observables are through pass integrals, just like that. Um, now, these uh, functional integrals, uh, more properly speaking, can be renormalized in, in the case of uh, gauge theories, uh, Yang Mills theory, and they are quite successful. That's kind of basic uh, uh, tools they use in the standard model. However, even the most daring physicists cannot handle the uh, pass integral for quantum gravity yet. So that's the, that's the problem of quantum gravity. So uh, as you know, this is the Einstein-Hilbert action. And if you want to put it up there, somehow uh, things won't work, renormalization, stuff like that. There's a book by Feynman where he, he gave some, something like 27 lectures already in early 1960s 
it's, it's a great read to, to know about the struggles that uh, he, he was facing every week when he was preparing his lecture. So to, 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 uh, so what, what, are, what, what the issues really are, and he had some, some new points of view. So, so having said that, one possibility to move on is uh, non-commutative geometry. Well, we know that uh, metric, which is the dynamical variable of, uh, of quantum theory of, should be dynamical variable of quantum theory of gravity, is uh, captured in non-commutative geometry by Dirac operator, more or less fully. If you have a spin Riemannian manifolds, then the geodesic distance uh, between two points can be computed uh, by this formula due to Alan Cohn. And this formula is the perfect dual of the standard classic formula from, from differential geometry. It says here's the infimum, here's the supremum. And uh, so, so basically what, what happens here is that in, in, in the classic formula, you're probing the space by putting curves in the space and studying the lengths of those curves and then find you. In, in the first approach, in the second approach, in, in Kahn's approach, you're probing the space by looking at fields on the space uh, or sections of bundles and things like that. So it's, it's a dual approach, but the formula nevertheless is quite, uh, quite, quite effective. So this idea led to, as we know, uh, Kahn's notion of non-commutative Riemannian manifolds or spectral triples. Basically, you have these three things, uh, algebra, Hilbert space, algebra, star algebra acting by bounded operators on the Hilbert space. There's an unbounded uh, self-adjoint Dirac operator that has some nice relation with A. With the action of A and uh, D has to, to have, uh, yeah, discrete uh, spectrum and it has compact resolvance, things like that, but they won't really matter much for us because we are going to look at finite dimensional spectral triples. So many of these analytic issues actually will be, will be uninteresting for us. Only some algebraic things uh, will be interesting. Uh, so then as, as uh, okay, so this is not moving now. Okay, yes. So uh, as a simple example uh, of, uh, Okay, so I should, I, I went too fast. So a, a very simple example of a Dirac uh, uh, operator you can have in mind, just take, think of N by N matrices and uh, just uh, your Dirac operator would be commutator of your N by N matrices with some Hermitian matrix. And this gives you, a, immediately gives you a spectral triple. Yes, Ezra. Sorry, Oh, I believe in this case is anti-commutator. Ah. Uh, actually, it's 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 so anti. It's plus X. Yes. <laughs> With some other decorations, you can also bring in commutators. Okay. Yeah, using some sort of supersymmetry uh, things. So this was a kind of beginning point of a model for. Uh, I still call it toy uh, Euclidean quantum gravity by uh, John John Barrett, who talked yesterday. He proposed these models, and then the, together with uh, uh, L. Glaser, they uh, studied these models uh, through um, Monte Carlo Markov chains. So the model is uh, like a partition function pass integral for, uh, for, 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 for quantum theory of gravity. Uh, so, but instead of integrating over metrics, you integrate over Dirac operators now. Dynamical variables are now Dirac operators. So you need just an action over there, a simple action in terms of Dirac operators, looks simple. It's just uh, like a quartic action, which is very important in, in the theory of phase transitions, for example. <coughs> Sorry. So this quartic action, and uh, now, if you uh, write this quartic action in terms of the original matrix H that defines the Dirac operator, it becomes something quite complicated. Uh, in this case, uh, you see there are things like that. There are terms like that. Now, these terms, if you study a random matrix theory, you see that these are kind of undesirable terms because they are like, uh, undesirable means they're difficult because they are products of traces. 
These are the models that are called multi-trace models. Usually random matrix techniques work well with a single trace and single matrix, but here these are multi-trace and even worse, they are multi-matrix models. Typically the models are going to be like that. So what uh, they uh, did, uh, Barrett Glazer, they observed a few phenomena through their uh, numerical studies. One was phase transition uh, uh, through the uh, spectral density uh, functions of, of these models. Uh, the second one was uh, near critical points, uh, the kind of manifold like behavior at critical points. So this is a bit like critical point theory in, 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 in condensed matter in a way, well, something really strange happens uh, at the critical point. So, so my, that was my kind of a starting point. I, I, I tried to understand these models analytically using techniques of um, random matrix theory and all that, but I was so naive. I didn't know that random matrix theory is a huge subject and I didn't know what I'm getting myself into. So it, it really, I had, so, so it really took, took some time to grasp some of it, uh, at least very, maybe small, but then uh, do something with it. So, um, yeah, so as I said, these models are multi-trace and uh, multi-matrix. Yeah, okay, so as it said. Now, the objects of interest in random matrix theory there are several objects of interest. One of them is, for example, if you stay at finite n is uh, uh, mean eigenvalue density function. So for each matrix H, so imagine you are now integrating this H n space of Hermitian n by n matrices. For each matrix H, you have this discrete uh, probability measure mu n of H, which is, gives you the eigenvalue distribution of H, it has n eigenvalues counting <coughs> degeneracies. P of H is the Gaussian measure on uh, this uh, space of Hermitian matrices like e to the minus n times trace of H squared and dH is the Lebesgue measure. So you do this uh, integration and if you are lucky, you can compute this integral. This integral is quite hard actually to explicitly compute but there is some nice smooth function comes out row n of x. This is the probability density of eigenvalues at finite n, and you want to study large and limit, rescale large and limits. And for that, a uh, lot of things are known provided uh, on the, what type of potentials you are you're using. So in practice, what you do, you study um, not just that, uh, it's very hard to study the, the, the function row and the, 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 prob the density function itself. You study its moments or cumulants of, of these things in probability theory. So the moments in this case are, have nice expressions. These are expectation values of these scalar valued functions on a space of, uh, Hermitian matrices like one over n trace of h to the k. Uh, for fixed k, these guys uh, tend to have a limit as n goes to infinity, and they provide moments of this uh, large uh, n uh, limit of this probability uh, density function. So this is basically what we expect to observe if we take a large matrix and uh, study its uh, and numerically study its eigenvalues, then you get some distribution, which is predicted by these moments. And if you are very lucky, you can reconstruct even the, the measure through these uh, uh, moments, but that's very rare. Uh, so as I said, so I, I will highlight several things that uh, we did. So. Basically, we used um, three methods. Uh, one was uh, topological expansion or genus expansion. The second one was uh, uh, bootstrapping. Well, that's the third one. Uh, last thing that we resorted to was bootstrapping. And this, but second one was uh, uh, so, sort of variational techniques. It's called Coulomb gas methods or uh, log, uh, logarithmic gas methods, I, I, I will explain. So using these things, uh, three methods, you can get some uh, analytic results, some, some you, can, you can confirm some, some, of, some of the uh, 
things that have been observed numerically and also uh, even more. So the genus expansion is a cornerstone of random matrix theory. Uh, so imagine you have a potential of the form TK over K, X to the K. Well, you put X to be H. In, 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 so so you, have the, you have a partition function for your Hermitian matrix ensemble uh, like that. And this result was first actually seen by Tooft uh, in his work in a strong force in 1970s. And then it was generalized and very well understood by uh, uh, Berzan, Itzikson, Parisian, Zuber in 1978. They wrote two very influential papers in that year. And uh, so what does it say is that if you take the free energy, you take the log of the partition function, there is a expansion in terms of inverse powers of N. You can organize everything around the genus of, uh, of, 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 of a surface for each surface of genus G, you, uh, basically the, this Feynman weight, it counts the number of different polygonalizations of, 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 of the surface. Now the type of uh, polygonalization depends on these, uh, these uh, coefficients here. For example, if you have a power of three means that you're using triangles. If you have power of four squares, power of five pentagons, stuff like that. So this is the simplest type of topological expansion. Uh, but in, in the models that we, we, we looked at, actually you have to go beyond this sort of topological expansion because in, 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 in the topological expansion, um, all you use are maps. So what is a map? A map is a graph that's drawn on a, on, on, on a surface, say compact surface without boundary, but doesn't have to be without boundary, such that the complement of the graph is a union of cells, two-dimensional cells. But this is not that case because here you have non-contractible domains. And these non-contractible domains, uh, these are things that uh, are dictated by more complicated type of potentials that we have. They are not just polynomials. They have, uh, they have mixed interacting terms between these things. It's, it's, they come from, um, from multi-trace picture of the, of the potential. So um, in, in, in the first paper, we looked at uh, these sort of things. It was a lucky situation because we met uh, 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 Gaetan Borot, who is an expert, he had just developed a blob topological recursion, and he told us that this is exactly what you need. So we just jumped into this and uh, grabbed it, and it turned out that this is actually a great uh, subject uh, than uh, the work of Inard and Orantan uh, on topological recursion. So we studied that a little bit, and uh, yeah, it's it's a whole circle of ideas, and we just came from this direction of non-commutative geometry. It was quite quite exciting to see that non from non-commutative geometry, from this finite spectral triples, you meet uh, this really beautiful mathematics. Uh, uh, so, in, in this uh, pay first paper, uh, that's not the focus of my talk, but. Uh, what we did, we computed the spectral curve. I'll tell you what the spectral curve is immediately. And then uh, there are these basically two uh, symmetric bidifferential forms, uh, one, omega zero one and omega zero two. And this topological recursion tells you how to compute all higher moments, basically. I mean, basically it tells you how to solve the model by some very complicated procedure, but very explicit at the same time and recursive. Recursion is by the way, on the negative of genus of the surface. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Euler characteristic of the surface. Genus is positive. Euler characteristic is typically negative, especially for hyperbolic surfaces. And when you in, induct on that, you get an induction procedure uh, that uh, gives you the, these uh, coefficients fgs. But that's... Uh, um, Okay, so also if I want to tell you about um, uh, a spectral curve and uh, the second method that we used was uh, this, this non-perturbative methods, 
the so-called resolvent techniques, what, what you do, this is quite a standard. This is known, uh, I mean, uh, certainly in functional analysis, maybe not in this form, but uh, in, in random matrix theory literature from 1960s, this is a great idea. You introduce the green function of your matrix. This is a deterministic matrix. Uh, so, but then when you uh, integrate it, uh, you take its average, you, you get a very nice function. This, fun this, this map, basically what it is, uh, so I call it green function, but it's also called Stilges transform or Cauchy transform. It comes by, by other names. What happens is that if you have a probability density function or even a measure with finite, uh, finiteness properties on, 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 on the real line, real measure, you get a holomorphic function in the upper half plane or lower, lower half plane. You get a holomorphic function on, on, on the complement of the support of your measure. Yeah. And then uh, this holomorphic function, uh, GNZ, uh, this allows you to study things uh, using complex analysis uh, to study uh, probability effects through complex analysis. And the thing is, this is kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. You can also recover the measure from this uh, function by a formula, which is uh, Plemel, Sokotsky, and perhaps was even known to Cauchy, I'm not sure. The formula is, uh, is this. If you want to recall, recover the, the probability density function or your measure at a point in the support, you compute the imaginary part of the green function. You take this limit uh, from above as epsilon goes to zero, and this uh, gives you the, uh, the, the, the function. So there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. So in practice, what happens is that you first compute that GN, and then you try to use this formula to get information about the uh, probability density function. Now, um, so uh, always you can show that with those uh, single potential models or single matrix models, your um, green function satisfies the differential equation. This I believe is this kind of generalization of Riccati differential equation. This is a nonlinear, ordinary differential equation. Gn is the unknown. V is your potential, which is known. That function P of X can also be computed explicitly, although it's not so trivial, but this can be also computed explicitly. So, so here you have a differential equation that gives you the green function. If you compute the green function, you have this row N, but that's a very hard process. And this equation is very hard to, 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 to solve. Uh, I mean, it's hardly integrable, but when uh, you go to large n limit uh, as n goes to infinity, you can show that actually safely you can neglect that one over n term, even against g prime of x. And then you get a spectral curve here. So basically you get an algebraic relation, a quadratic relation between g and v prime, and you can solve it. And you pick one of the roots uh, because uh, g of x has to behave like one over x for large x, uh, so that's why you have to choose. So this is an algebraic curve. Uh, yeah, you can just take x and g of x. You can, you can imagine this is y. This is a kind of hyper elliptic curve, and this this is a central. This plays a central role uh, role in in in, the, in 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 the theory. This is the spectral curve. Um, now, the simplest case of uh, this would be just if you take the D of x to be one over two x squared, just uh, um, uh, this is a, like a free particle. I mean, there, there's, there's just kinetic energy. There's, there's no interaction. So this corresponds to Gaussian unitary ensembles, the GUEs. If you, if you, if you do that, you can just exactly solve the model explicitly. You, you derive the Wigner semicircular law from this. And uh, you can also show that if the value of the parameter is near zero, you have only one cut, but in general, you, have, uh, you can have several cuts. So your, the, the support of your measure is going to be, in general, uh, going to be like this. So uh, yeah, in, in the single cut model, this is Wigner, but in general, you will have, uh, several cuts. And finding this uh, abscissa of these points 
is 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 in general quite a task and but there are methods uh, you can do it at least in some cases okay then uh these uh, non-perturbative methods so starting from this uh, uh ideas of uh, um yeah that, that, that i just mentioned there is uh, one more technique that's very uh, important in random matrix theory, and we had to use it actually in order to see that uh, phase transition uh, point uh, rigorously. That's the saddle point approximations. So, so basically, that Gaussian, that that integral, that exponential integral, I should say, integral over Hermitian NYM matrices e to the f of h. Um, when you think about it, uh, I mean, in the simplest models, the integrand is unitary invariant. So you can use Boyle's integration formula and you, you reduce to uh, integration over, uh, of, of, over the eigenvalue space, which is Rn. So Hn, remember, is, is as dimension n squared, but now using the unitary invariance. And this term, this Vandermoen term, is just the determinant of the change of variables that you go from Hn to, 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 to Rn. So you have now an explicit uh, expression for your partition function. So you introduce these two functions, V of S and U of S and T. This is the multi-trace part, and this is the single trace part. And uh, what happens is that this integrate uh, this integral basically organizes itself around its critical points. So the bulk of the com computation, uh, bulk of the value of the integral comes for, 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 for large values of n comes from the critical points. Um, so now this, uh, the, the, there is a, 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 a theorem that uh, tells you that actually, and this is a rigorous theorem, it's not uh, formal, it tells you that actually the equilibrium measure uh, rho x dx is the probability measure that minimizes the energy functional. There is this energy functional I of mu given by this integral here. And you have to uh, find the uh, minimizers of this. And if you think about it, this is kind of Euler Lagrange process for, uh, for, for solving, uh, for finding the critical points of uh, classical mechanics. This is uh, in, in this uh, Coulomb gas method or logarithmic gas method. Uh, it's called log, log gas or Coulomb gas. Uh, it's log gas because in, in two dimensions, the Coulomb potential is log. Uh, so that's why it's, uh, we have this terminology. And uh, then what happens is that, oh uh, uh, yeah, so, the person's name I was looking for is Percy Dave, which is here, who did uh, almost all the mathematics, uh, rigorous mathematics of these aspects of random uh, random matrix theory. This is what he did is much more general as part of his uh, theory of nonlinear Riemann-Hilbert correspondence, all motivated, of course, by random matrix theory. In this case, you really, you can show that actually the minimizer satisfies the differential equation like this. So you're, you're looking for a function rho whose Cauchy principal value uh, satisfies this sort of differential equation. Well, the, the, the parameters M1, M3, and M2, these are moments of, of your probability density function, and they have to be either fit in, uh, for example, M1 has to be one, things like that, but then uh, higher moments have to be calculated explicitly. Okay. Um, well, this differential equation in this case turns out to be solvable. So what, what, what do I mean by in this case? I mean, so I didn't tell you about the hierarchy of all these models, these um, uh, spectral triples that you use. So these spectral triples are parameterized by uh, Clifford algebra uh, parameterization of uh, actually real Clifford algebra. So there are two parameters, P and Q. So for each P and Q, you have this Clifford algebra CLPQ, but then uh, depending on that, you have these um, spectral triples that was introduced again, I'm saying by John. So this 
corresponds to the case where we have one zero. Also, zero one also can be can be can be computed. Um, but beyond that, uh, solving that integral equation is very very hard. You can only uh, be, uh, numerically. So the the value of phase transition point we found turned out to be uh, the critical point for the coupling constant. In, in this quartet integral, remember G was in front of uh, X squared. So it was G trace of H2, and then there was trace of H4, which didn't have any coupling constants. Um, so it turns out to be minus 3.5. <laughs> well, this is a, a bit of, there's a bit of correction needed there. So uh, this is not quite 3.5. We found the mistake in the calculation, so we had to fix it, but that's very close to that. And they also uh, numerically uh, came across this value uh, by, by Monte Carlo Markov chain. So when we saw that the analytic methods and numerical methods matched, this was a very good in indication, of course. This was quite, uh, quite useful. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. The, the total degree is one, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing that, uh, yeah, okay, so this is the regime where the multi-cut multi emerges because you have a single cut and then when you change the coupling constant, when you cross the phase transition, there is a, it changes into a, a double cut, but it doesn't go beyond double cut. It's just double cut or single cut. And this is an aspect of phase transition. What happens at the cut point is another story. It's very, very important and um, as I said, there is this manifold-like behavior that's also observed, but that seems to be uh, theoretically uh, very difficult to, to grasp at the moment. So uh, we didn't do much in that. Okay, are there any questions, by the way? Yes. So you're talking about the sun point. Can you go back to one of the slides? I mean, yes. At large end, yes, yes, exactly, yeah, yes, that's that's exactly what it is, exactly, yeah, yeah. But uh, for obvious reason, this is called equilibrium measure because this minimizes the energy. This is a, this is a concept of energy, yeah. Energy functional, yeah. All right, so that's for that. Uh, now, uh, the subject of the talk proper is uh, bootstrapping. So as I said, this was uh, all motivated by a paper of Henry Lean, um, but then we thought that, okay, so, so, so it would be very useful to, to, to use it in our context as well. Uh, so the steps of bootstrapping, um, is that first of all, you find the Schrodinger Dyson. I'll tell you what these are in case you haven't met them before. Schrodinger Dyson equations of the model, and then you go to large and limits. You get uh, loop loop equations, and then uh, you do you have to do some 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 algebraic analysis of the these equations. You find the minimum number of parameters that are free, and the rest of the moments that will enter into the game. You you have to be convinced that the rest or depend uh, just depends on, on, on this first few. So kind of the start of the recursion process because it's not quite a recursion. Then we apply hamburger, hamburger uh, moment theorem, which uh, is basically positivity constraints. Uh, and this is not difficult to understand at all. Um, I will uh, tell you. And then choose a cutoff and work with the uh, words in moments of some length. And then you do get uh, you do get uh, what you want. The only thing is that we don't know. Uh, although I mean everybody believes that this theorem is this there should be a theorem there, but we don't know how to prove that if you increase the value of the cutoff, um, things remain stable. Things don't change much. But in any example that has been looked at, this is kind of the situation. So, but so so now this is to talking in abstract. Let me just tell you what I have in mind. So first of all, starting with Schrodinger-Dyson equations, what are they? 
Well, they can be even uh, done for multi-trace, multi-matrix models. Uh, you don't have to be in, 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 in one matrix or um, single trace. So in general, if you have an expression, so that S could be a polynomial in H1, H2, Hn, and matrices, Hermitian matrices, you're integrating against the um, Lobeck measures, product Lobeck measures on products of Hermitian uh, matrices spaces. And um, what you are really interested in is uh, you, you pick a word in, in the alphabet of matrix variables, say H1, H2, Hn, a non commutative word in, uh, word in general. And uh, you want to uh, look at the expectation value of trace of these products of uh, things. Uh, uh, average uh, one over n, and that's uh, that's what 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 you're interested in, basically. Oh, I have to go back. So these are these are the numbers that you're interested in. And Schwinger Dyson equation gives you relations between these numbers when you change the words. Um, for example, if you have a single matrix model with a uh, simple word like just your matrix to some power. So basically, you, in this case, you are interested in imagine computing trace of uh, H1 uh, to the L for various values of uh, L. Then uh, these relations you can show that exist uh, between uh, between um, expectation values. But the, the difficulty with these relations uh, is that um, they are not quite uh, like a recursion relation. It's two, these relations, they are con certainly constraints on the moments of your matrix model, the moments of the, the, the gadgets, constraint between gadgets that you want to study, but uh, they are kind of unwidely and there's no recursion structure there. That would be very obvious to start with. Um, by the way, these relations just come from uh, integration by parts. You have this matrix uh, integral, you do integrate by part and you get that. Okay, so then um, something very, very interesting happens. So this, this is the first formula, the schwinger dyson works for any finite n. But as you go to infinity, something very, very interesting happens. There's this factorization. So this factorization, of course, is known from quantum field theory also. These things, uh, expectations, values, factorize. In this case, uh, this uh, kind of mixed moment here, one over n trace of H1a, one over n trace of H1b, it factorizes as products of traces. And th there is, uh, okay, to prove this, you need some uh, delicate estimates. I mean, this is like a large deviation theory, which has been developed for this and works fine. The difference is O of n minus two. And then as a result, as n goes to infinity, you really get uh, that uh, expectations of products of products of expectations. So this, uh, sorry. I, I don't quite. Yeah, each term is all one. Yeah, yeah, each, yeah, yeah. That you have to normalize. Yeah, this is kind of risk. You have to risk scale from from beginning. Yes, exactly. Uh, so then you have these um, uh, little mk's, which are the large and limits of these uh, single moments. And uh, the the other idea I, I explained it. So you look for the small number of uh, these mk's such that all other MKs will depend only on those. In all models that we looked at, these MKs just, de just depending on M1 only. So this was like a, a kind of still a lucky situation. So um, again, this for type one zero Dirac ensembles, uh, uh, this S, uh, the, 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 the potential is a multi-matrix model like this. Schwinger Dyson equations uh, at large and limit, which are called loop equations. Uh, well, they can be also called Schwinger Dyson, doesn't matter. Uh, these are these, these relations between uh, moments. 
And in this case, we can show that actually everything just depends on M2. All higher moments can be computed from M2. So if you know you have you, you know the M2, you know everything from these relations. However, finding M2 is very hard. Find, finding M2, the second moment, is, is, is tantamount to solving the problem completely. So um, now what, what you can do, I mean, remember this M2 depends on G. It yeah, depends on your coupling constant G. Now, what you can do now here is the positivity constraint, which is a very, really nice uh, discovery. And this is a purely probability theory uh, statement, it has nothing to do with random matrix theory, it's just pure probability theory. If you have a probability measure on the line and you look at the moments, uh, these moments satisfy the condition that the Hankel matrix of moments, moments is uh, positive semi definite. In, in the sense that if you cut the matrix at any upper left corner, these matrices are all uh, positive semi-definite. This is, this is the Hankel matrix of, of, of the moments. And this gives you infinite number of constraints between these, these, uh, these moments. Uh, actually, there is also a converse theorem. If you have a sequence of numbers, M1, M2, M3, and so on, such that this matrix is positive semi-definite. And these numbers grow not too bad at infinity. This is the Hamburger's theorem that shows that there is a probability measure uh, on the line this, uh, whose moments are exactly these things. We don't use the inverse theorem. We just use the positivity thing. That's the, that's, that's the only thing that you need. Okay. Now, something uh, very interesting about Dirac ensembles is that th there are two things here, two operators like there's this H, which is like a ghost uh, uh, Dirac operator, and there is D, which is the actual Dirac operator. There, there are two operators, and the eigenvalues are quite different. Uh, we understand the eigenvalue of H better than eigenvalue of D, in fact, and so on. Uh, you're, you're, typically really interested in eigenvalue of D, but okay. But what happens is that these Ds also have bootstrap, uh, has this positivity constraint. I mean, that's more or less clear. If you define the moments, moments of D, again, these are just moments of some probability distribution, probability distribution of uh, Dirac ensemble itself. And they have, okay, so then this means that you have even more constraints on, on the problem and having more constraints is better, always better than having fewer constraints. So you have two sets of infinite number of constraints and you, 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 you uh, then uh, try to use them. Okay, so then, uh, yeah, you need really computer work because you have all these uh, things you cut, you start, for, for example, from the first eight constraints and you have to write down the conditions for positivity of determinants of all those sub matrices. And then uh, what happens that you gradually narrow the, uh, the domain of uh, uh, that the, all the constraints are satisfied. And uh, if you just uh, um, look at, yeah, I think in, in the case that we looked at was the uh, number of uh, the cutoff was eight or nine or something. And that already, constrained it quite a bit. And then you do get the relation between M2 and G. So this is the curve that defines M2 and G. It's the intersection of all these positivity domains. This, this blue curve is, is the one. Yes. Mm, yes, yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. No, they're not independent. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. In one case, we could show that they actually the spectral distribution for D is the convolution of the spectral distribution of, 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 of for H with itself. But in general, I don't know. Yeah. So that's that's the thing. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. 
The, 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 yeah, I, I believe there is there are relations, definitely. I mean, I, I definitely believe so, but I, I didn't look at those relations. But at this stage, this is really just uh, what we have. This is for values of uh, coupling constant between minus five and minus two point five. So this is to the um, right of the uh, if uh, well, this is the this is the the, the range anyhow, right? Uh, just, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as well uh, yeah because this is also moments of a probability distribution oh, okay. exactly yeah okay. it doesn't matter so hamburger's theorem is is, is is a theorem of probability theory if you want that's nothing to do with anything but, 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 Um, yeah, I have. I think we have to disentangle from this matrix to understand Hamburger's problem. I mean, Hamburger's moment theorem. It's, I, I just use that part. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I use the easy part of the theorem. I don't use the complicated part, which is the difficult part. Which, yeah, the, actually, in, in book of Reed and Simon, I don't know, volume three or four. I think they give a proof using operator algebra. Even there are other proofs also. That's 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 a fascinating theorem, of course. Um, so this was uh, a kind of uh, warm up because in this case we could use uh, this bootstrap to see that uh, that uh, phase transition point minus 2.5 that we, we found by this uh, Coulomb gas method also they found using numerical uh, studies uh, can be also obtained using bootstrap so this was this was pretty good this was kind of rewarding uh, I mean reassuring I would say. But the, the really difficult case was this uh, type 2.0 random geometries. Again, we don't have to know what type 2.0 means. We can just look at the Dirac operators, which is given by Pauli spin matrices like that. And, uh, but here there are two matrices, A and B, uh, Hermitian matrices A and B that defines your Dirac operator. So this is a double matrix model if you want. And again, you look at the uh, partition function, which is given uh, with respect to the action, which is a quartic action. Quartic action is already quite good and quite complicated. So this, this is a model that cannot be solved uh, analytically. There, 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 there are no, no solutions. But uh, Bootstrap actually gives you uh, some very good solutions. So you see, let, let me tell you what, <laughs> In terms of A and B, you get these uh, polynomials, uh, trace of D squared and trace of D4. So you get all these terms, and these are, uh, these are yeah, uh, honestly, quite, quite complicated terms. Uh, I mean, usually, these are not the things that people in random matrix theory look at, because they have no reason to look at these expressions. But we have all the reason to look at these expressions, because they come from quartic actions in terms of Dirac operators in a very natural way. Um, so, in general, this is of this form. I mean, they can analytically solve these models again for very, very particular type of S of A and B. I mean, there's only one product term A, B maybe, and then the other. Anyhow, so, uh, but Bootstrap in this case uh, is quite successful, was quite successful. In fact, uh, the moments, there are uh, all kinds of moments because uh, you have now two matrices A and B, you can play them, uh, uh, in, uh, put them in, in, into any kind of non-commutative expression. So you have any non-commutative expression A and B, and you compute the corresponding trace, and you compute the large and limits. Uh, this, this exists. Uh, I mean, in this case, you don't even have to scale that we can show. So the Schwinger Dyson equations or loop equations in this case are this system of equations plus, plus more. I mean, this is just sample. Um, so, um, yes, so, uh, yes, so, so, so uh, I mean, uh, so what happens is that then you have to choose a cutoff. I think the cutoff, uh, the, the cutoff is in the total order of, so you have your M, L1, L2, L3, L4, you just sum L1 plus L2 plus L3, L4, 
to be some constant. I believe we took it eight or nine. I'm not sure now. Uh, but then uh, again, what happens, and this was not an easy task to do, but you show that actually, if you know M2, uh, Schrodinger Dyson equations uniquely define all higher moments. So for example, uh, M4 is given by this relation, M22 and 111 and M6, and even uh, all uh, higher mixed moments uh, can be, I guess, uh, I don't have a proof that uh, the, the actually polynomials that you get through this uh, must, be, must have some beautiful properties and uh, there should be some closed formulas for this thing, but I really don't know. Uh, well, we didn't look at this, uh, very, but this is an interesting problem. Okay, so then you set up your constraint uh, problems. Also, the moments that you can take also for Dirac ensembles, in this case, are just single moments because that's a single matrix uh, in, in the case of Dirac ensembles. And in terms of uh, these things, here is, a, is an answer to your question, Ezra. Actually, these things now, uh, you can see that they can be expressed in terms of uh, the other moments. Uh, there are some complicated expressions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yes, indeed. Uh, so again, we just do the positivity constraints. And uh, so in this case, actually, one of my students had to learn semi-definite programming and some some really uh, numerical, uh, I don't know what's the, what's the name of the subject, but semi-definite pro programming is, is quite, uh, quite effective. He had to learn that in order to, uh, to use these techniques. And once uh, you do that, again, you can actually, um, yeah, you can uh, draw the, the domains. You have to see it like this, the blue domain and uh, the yellow, whatever domain, from they, they have a little bit of intersection and that intersection is in the um, middle uh, curve, which is um, actually nonlinear in this case. And uh, that really is, gives you the dependence of the second moment again on, on, on the coupling constants and phase transitions also in this case, you can, you can see uh, the behavior of the curve cha changes as, as you cross. I'm not sure we, we calculated this, uh, the phase transition point in this case. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure about that, yeah. Um, uh, so what, okay, five minutes. What we are doing, uh, we are doing now uh, is uh, something we call Aerie Dirac Ensemble. So this Aerie Dirac is really, you take like this, um, a matrix model of Konsevich, and uh, in, in his case, it was integration over HN, over Hermitian matrices, and those integrals where uh, you have a external source, which is a matrix lambda, coupled to your, uh, uh, in, in, in the original case, coupled to your Hermitian matrix H, we want to couple it to our Dirac operator, and, and we want to study this. We want to study this uh, Airy matrix, uh, well, Airy Dirac ensemble. Um, so the subject of this conference is emergent uh, geometries. Um, I believe some geometry will emerge from just uh, this uh, uh, innocent spectral triple. Who would think that uh, just the spectral triple with this action would lead to some, some, some beautiful geometry, some, something like uh, geometry of Riemann surfaces? I, we don't know yet, but certainly, I mean, in one case, actually, you can show that this uh, something similar to that, not quite, I'll, 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 I will give you the, the example, uh, satisfies some Panlové equation, some nonlinear ODEs, which uh, also uh, is, is typical for uh, random matrix models. And um, so what happens in this case is quite interesting. Uh, this uh, integral is only conditionally convergent. That doesn't matter. You can, you have to do counter um, actually change uh, to, to, to make it uh, absolutely convergent. That's, that's doable, like the original uh, area function integral and a lot of interesting issues should, should come, out, come out of that. So, but this is not, uh, let me not just mention that. The case that we studied actually was a, another cubic uh, Dirac ensemble. This is actually in the survey paper that uh, uh, 
we wrote for this volume, uh, it's published now. Uh, so uh, so we, we looked at this uh, cubic uh, Dirac ensemble. Now this cubic uh, Dirac ensembles actually, uh, they don't have, uh, they are not of interest for uh, quantum gravity, I would say, because um, this, I mean, these integrals are not convergent. It's a cubic, so it's, 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 it's a divergent integral. But perturbatively, it makes perfect sense. If you switch the integration with summation, you get a perturbation series, and then the, each term has, has very, very uh, interesting meaning. So we computed this um, and using bootstrap method again. And uh, again, um, the, the kind of curve that's in the intersection of all those uh, positivity domains is right in the middle. And uh, you can you can say a lot about about, about it in this case. Um, also, existence of phase transitions and other things. But um, so this is an indication that perhaps we can study this uh, uh, Dirac or airy Dirac ensembles uh, with with bootstrap method. Although I mean this is a pure imaginary phase up there, and uh, so uh, but yeah so. Um, uh, so I was going to, so John mentioned uh, uh, coupling to fermions. Uh, so actually now we are doing coupling to fermions. Uh, so there is a, so yeah, I mean, so the, the philosophy here is that well, you see what Kahn and Shamsuddin and Kahn and Marcoli did, they, they took the spectral action and coupled it to gravity. So they had this finite space F and tensored it with C infinity of M and they set up the spectral action for the standard model and using uh, asymptotic expansion of um, basically heat kernels uh, of the model properly modified because of that internal space F, they could get uh, a lot of the, I mean, okay, so they could get uh, interesting uh, physics. So the idea here would be that uh, we just take this toy model and couple it to this internal space F. And uh, well, there's no, uh, there's no asymptotic analysis in that case. Uh, but uh, so, so the question should be different. So just to start with, uh, you, you add this, uh, you, you, you wanna add just one uh, fermionic action, which is psi d psi. And your, 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 your uh, partition function is going to be uh, some, uh, yeah, there's an integration here missing. Well, no, no, this is the probability measure for the, for the partition function, this is correct. But integration is over, over the space of Dirac operators and over this uh, Hilbert space, fermion Hilbert space. So this uh, actually, my student Luke Verhoeven has pushed this, uh, but I don't have time to discuss, so I. No. So he didn't use actually in this case, uh, yeah, good question. He didn't use, um, yeah, indeed, Fafians appear and this sort of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 log of, yeah, 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 here. Uh, here is uh, Fafian actually. There's the term in Fafian for, for the, yeah. But what happens is that you can use a still this log gas method, the second method that we used. So using the log gas method, he drives an integral equation. And uh, when the mass M is equal to zero, you can solve actually the integral equation. Uh, in this case, you solve it. When it is not zero, you can numerically study this. And he did all the studies. So this is in his thesis actually. So let me just make it now, I'm, I'm glad. So yeah, you see you have this bosonic sector, fermionic sectors and Jacobian's change of variable, the Vandermann. Yeah, you, you do this uh, log gas method, as I said, and uh, you do get, uh, so here is the integral equation. This is the integral equation. You have an explicit kernel. This is the Fredholm equation. This part is known. P of X is also known. And the unknown is rho. Our kernel is kind of, yeah, it's just like that. Okay, so then, um, you can uh, solve it in the case of when mass is zero, he did uh, solve it in this case. And, uh, but uh, yes, he also has constraints. Well, not constraints. I mean, some, some algebraic equation that gives you the support of the measure. 
the measure is supported on this interval minus a minus a a and minus b b or things like that. But then these equations gives you uh, actually uh, the values of a and b if you care to solve them to find the value. And for uh, for non-zero m. Again, the only thing that you can do in this case, it seems to be uh, study them uh, numerically and uh, yeah, okay. So you, you, you have a good uh, idea of spectral densities in this case, also the phase transition and uh, emergence of double cut regimes and uh, single cut. And okay. so, okay, so I should stop. Um, so these seven, uh, sorry, six papers, all of them are published except the first one. Uh, the first one is absorbed in the others. So maybe we should forget publishing the first one. I don't know, but uh, that's, uh, but that was really beginning uh, with, with my student, uh, Shahab Azafar. So I should really acknowledge his amazing contributions. So, uh, well, thank you very much. John. Oh, okay. the microphone but it's no more oh, I see oh I see okay yeah where here yeah yeah this is density of H and density of D both are studied Yeah. Yeah, Ezra. So in the first part of the talk, the Dirac operator is a silver joint. But you have but in the second part you need a skewer joint Dirac operator. And that's uh, very much. Oh, oh there is a you you multiply by J, I believe, and that takes care of that. Yeah. So you have two you have actually two things. No. No, they are complexified. They are. Sorry. What are you taking? What operate? What matrix are you taking? It, 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 oh, the, uh, so the, the space. Of, yeah. So the space of Dirac operators depends on the type of model that you're using. So in the simplest type, it's just the Hermitian and by n matrices. You just use Hermitian and by n matrices. Yes, but then it's not. Uh, so let me just uh, look at the formula. Yeah, this is Fafian of J inverse D. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I, I went, uh, I went too fast. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. This is J, uh, which is looks good. Yeah, and you have two options uh, in uh, this I bar this I or this I Fafian or determinant. Sorry. Best way that it's Euclidean or not. Different the the J there. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yes. But in general, we call often Dirac operator for the moment. Uh -huh. Self adjoint. Yes, that's self adjoint. I get on. That's right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, is that angular bracket X? No, that is symmetric. If it's symmetric, then D has to be skew symmetric because the side is equals minus. Yeah, that's what it's symmetric. Yes, that was my question. Because in the first part of the 
Yeah, the first one was. Sorry. Yeah. The, 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 the last one or okay so let's move on uh this is this this is the uh, yeah sorry which one uh, sorry you mean the right or right or the red uh, yeah, the, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, this is numerical. I mean, it depends on, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, this, yeah, still. I don't know. I mean, uh, I have to talk to Luke. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have yeah, I, 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 will, I, will, I will talk to you about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it holds. Yeah. For for, for, for multi matrix models also this is true. Uh where, where... Yes, for multi matrix models, this factorization property. This is a very generic uh, thing. It has to do only with uh, large deviation theory. I mean, this in, in, in this, it follows from that. I mean, this huge uh, matrix spaces they have when the, it's like it's it's a kind of law of large numbers or central limit theorem in, in a way, because things concentrate around the average, and you have this uh, in, because this is this is this is kind of independence in in, in the limit things become independent these uh, moments. Oh yeah, but 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 the, but the actions. Uh, I mean, uh, they have to have a unique minima. I mean, uh, for, for yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there is some convexity assumptions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not too. I mean, the action is not too too general. I mean, you can't. Otherwise, you you're you're. Then 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 yeah yeah of course yeah but not not here yeah yeah well we assume yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mexican hat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Am I? Am I done? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>